five most dangerous serial killers that have never been caught. Serial killings account for no more than 1% of all murders committed in the U.S. according to recent FBI crime statistics. There are approximately 15,000 to 20,000 murders committed annually. That means there are between 150 to 200 victims of serial murders in the U.S. every single year. There are currently between 25 and 50 active serial killers operating throughout the U.S. And if we are at the maximum end of that statistic, for every killer active, each one is responsible for three to four murders per year. Basically, serial killers are always present in society. And the 1980s were something of a high point for serial killers, with almost 770 that we know of were operating across the U.S. during that decade. That statistic dropped in the 1990s and then again in the 2000s. And by 2016, there have been about 100 serial killers that have been active in the past 10 years. There are potential theories to explain the decline of these crimes and they involve things like advancements of investigated methods, forensic science, higher chances of getting caught, and stricter prison sentencing. There are also factors like cell phones and an increased connectivity between parents and children that make picking out victims a little more difficult these days. It's also possible that young kids and teens who would have grown up to become serial killers are instead getting the mental health help they need early on in life. That's not to say there are no serial killers out there, and in addition to some that have managed to elude captivity for a long time, there are a handful of new ones cropping up too. This video will cover 5 serial killers that have yet to be caught as of 2022. Some are still active, and some statuses are currently unknown. Number 1. The Stockton Stalker One of the most recent serial killers to become active in the last few months has been terrorizing men in the Stockton, California area since July of 2022. According to local police who are investigating six deaths that appear to be connected, all of the men died were ambushed alone in the dark and police are baffled as to why they were targeted. None of the men were robbed or beaten before their killings and none of the victims appear to have known each other. Also, the shootings don't seem to be related to gang or drug activity either. What makes this different to your typical shooting is the calculation behind the murders. The killer is looking for an opportunity to attack in poorly lit environments where very little witnesses would be able to identify them. There also seems to be a pattern on what demographic he targets, which seems to be Hispanic men aged anywhere from 20 to 60 years old. Another detail to note is the recent decrease in the time span between each victim's death, meaning that the killer's executions are progressively increasing. This could be due to the fact this individual has gotten away with six homicides already and is now receiving nationwide attention, which is further motivating his agenda. The only tangible piece of evidence we have so far is a screen capture of the back of his body when he's walking down a sidewalk before pursuing one of his victims. Unfortunately, the suspect is fully covered in baggy clothing and is showing no identifying features for authorities to work with. Five of the shooting deaths occurred between the months of July and September 2022 in Stockton, California. The San Joaquin County Medical Examiner's Office relieved the names of some of the victims, which are Paul Alexander Yaw, 35 years old, who died on July 8th at 12.31 a.m., Salvador de Buddy Jr., 43, who died on August 11th at 9.49 p.m., Jonathan Hernandez Rodriguez, 21, who died on August 30th at 6.41 a.m., Juan Cruz, 52 years old, who died on September 21st at 4.27 a.m., and Lawrence Lopez Sr., 54, who died on September 27th at 1.53 a.m. Just a short six-day period elapsed between the fourth and fifth death, and the sixth potentially linked death that police are looking into occurred on April 10, 2021 in the nearby city of Oakland. Here's a look at the killings investigators have connected. Starting in April last year in Oakland, 39-year-old Juan Vasquez Serrano. Six days later, the shooting of a black woman in Stockton. She survived. Then this summer, five more victims in Stockton, most of them Hispanic men, starting on July 8th with the killing of 35-year-old Paul Yaw to September 27th with the shooting death of Lawrence Lopez Sr. Stockton police announced a $95,000 reward for information leading to an arrest in the killings. All five men were shot by a handgun, though it's not known if the same gun model was used in each crime. Police said the victims were each walking alone or were in a parked car when they were killed in the evening or early morning hours of their deaths. Authorities are warning community members to travel in well-lit areas and to remain vigilant with good situational awareness. That is currently all the information we have on this case, but if you live or know any adult males living in the Stockton, California area, please be very careful when going out late at night.
The search for a serial killer comes to an end in Stockton after police say they got their man. Chief Stanley McFadden says officers found 43-year-old Wesley Brownlee around 2 Saturday morning as he was driving and looking for his next shooting victim. We watched his patterns and determined early this morning he was on a mission to kill. He was out hunting. News of his arrest bringing peace to many in the Stockton community after weeks of sleepless nights. Officers credit the suspect's capture in part to helpful tips from the community. So I think we can indeed sleep well uh, and feel a sense of relief and we should also feel a sense of pride. But Stockton locals say law enforcement deserve much of the praise. So his capture just shows the, the diligence of our police force and uh, the commitment that they have to the community. So we're really proud of them and really pleased that they were able to apprehend this person. Stockton, where police say they have arrested the serial killer that's had the entire community on edge. 43-year-old Wesley Brownlee is set to face a judge tomorrow. CBS 13 has learned that three of the six murders he's accused of happened within a mile and a half of his home in Stockton, two in August and one in July. The first murder is believed to have happened in Oakland. So just who is Wesley Brownlee? CBS 13 investigative reporter Julie Watts is digging into public records. Well, he does have a criminal history, but it appears to be nonviolent. Records indicate he had a misdemeanor DUI in 2009 and a felony possession of cocaine in 2017. There are also several traffic infractions. In 2017, he was cited for failure to obey a traffic control device in Nevada, and in 2019, for failure to stop at a port of entry in Arizona. There were two other traffic citations in 2021 and 2022. And public records also indicate several possible relatives in Chicago. We're in the process of confirming that now, but of course, that would be significant because there's been speculation that the suspected Stockton serial killer, seen here in video on the left, is the same man suspected of very similar shootings in Chicago back in 2018. That suspect seen here on the right. Now, police say there's still no evidence to link the two, but Stockton and Chicago authorities tell us they are still in close contact. Throughout the entire arraignment, Brownlee did not appear to show any emotion. He did not speak other than responding to the judge's questions. And right now he is being charged with the murders of Jonathan Hernandez, Juan Cruz and Lawrence Lopez. He is also being charged with the possession of a firearm and ammunition, along with a slew of other charges. He's facing 25 to life without the possibility of parole. And based on the recommendation from the DA's office, he is being held without bail for the safety of the public. And while Brownlee is only being charged with three murders right now, the DA's office expects more to come. Number two, the Chicago Strangler. Back in 2019, the Chicago Tribune reported that police were assigning a designated task force to investigate the theory that there was a serial killer stalking the city. For many, it was an investigation that was long overdue, and it came more than a year after the news outlet had ran another story connecting the deaths of at least 75 women who had been killed between 2001 and 2018, all via suffocation or strangulation. The Chicago Tribune's initial story ran in 2018, and even as law enforcement continually denied the idea of a serial killer, four more more women turned up dead in that same manner. At the time, police were still refusing to say that there was a serial killer at work, but ultimately had to admit it was a definitive possibility. It is highly unlikely that these 50 women were murdered by 50 separate men. His warning to Gary, Indiana police proved accurate in 2014. After Darren Dion Van was charged with strangling a 19-year-old prostitute in Hammond, he confessed to murdering six other women in Gary, a pattern Hargrove pointed out to Gary police in 2010. We think it's extremely likely that there are common killer or killers in the Chicago series, as it was proven to be in Gary, Indiana. But the Chicago Police Department says that at this time, it has no actionable evidence of a pattern that would point to a serial killer. Fast forward to late 2021, there was a three-part docuseries called The Hunt for the Chicago Strangler that started streaming on Discovery+. Plus. At the time of the show's debut, Chicago police were still saying nothing to confirm or deny the existence of a serial killer and simultaneously, activists were demanding answers. The killings have been actively going on for the last 20 years with no further information as to who the perpetrator is. The victims were typically employed as sex workers and often had previous run-ins with the justice system. Nearly all were strangled, partially or fully stripped, and then left in abandoned buildings, alleys, garbage bins, parks, or snowdrifts. 25 of the cases were prematurely closed by police, resulting in the arrest of 13 men. 
and many of these strangulations were committed in the south and west sides of Chicago. Areas known for histories of violent crime and drug trafficking have been common locations for these murders to take place. This pattern was recognized in 2018 through the Murder Accountability Project, also referred to as MAP, which digitally reviewed over 50 unsolved strangulation and asphyxiation cases in the Chicago area dating as far back as 2001. The algorithm used by MAP filters unsolved homicides by location, victim, and killing method in order to identify clusters associated with low homicide clearance rates. According to MAP, the factors identified in the cases support the criminality pattern of an active serial killer. And despite their initial denial, following pressure from activists, the Chicago Police Department announced a new review of the 51 unsolved murders of the woman involved. To this day, the Chicago Police Department is adamant that there is no evidence that a serial killer is responsible for any of the 51 killings. Many people in the community and the family of the victims disagree. Their handling of the case is seen as an all-too-common treatment towards murder victims involving people people of color, and individuals living in low-income areas. Whether there is only one or multiple killers involved who have contributed to the homicide count, the case has gone cold since 2018, with no further information available at this time. Since 1999, dozens of women have been strangled, their bodies dumped, their murders unsolved. Strangulation, asphyxiation, every single one of them done the same way. They're not random acts of street violence. So is there any more? New docuseries called The Hunt for the Chicago Strangler explores the possibility of a link between their murders. So joining us now is Beverly Reed Scott, a Southside activist and a consulting producer of this new docuseries. Beverly, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Why did you feel the need to put this docuseries? Not enough attention being paid to this? Um, when I learned of the, the situation of, of them not having any attention placed upon uh, these murders, I felt like I needed to put myself in a position where I can attract some media attention and perhaps get something moving. So I held a vigil for the ladies and we said their names and uh, it made the news and I began a relationship with the chief of uh, detectives, Brendan Dinahan, at the police department in an effort to uh, convey the humanity of these ladies and to uh, keep them at work on these cases. What, what is it that makes you believe it may be the work of a serial strangler as opposed to um, just random crimes? No less tragic, but not w the work of one person. Okay, well, first of all, can't call them random. They're strangulations and sexual assaults. So, um, and there are so many of them and they are on the South and the West side. And uh, Thomas Hargrove at the Murder Accountability Project um, has, you know, grabbed, done a graph. In his mind, it's definitely serial killers. I don't know whether it's serial killers or uh, just misfortune on the, on the part of these ladies, but I know that they are dead and they deserve justice. And we asked the Chicago Police Department about these murders and this docu-series. Uh, the statement they gave us reads, each, each of these cases has been reviewed by detectives who were detailed to the FBI's Violent Crime Task Force and there's no evidence linking the cases to each other or to suggest there's a serial killer responsible for these homicides. Detectives are continuing to investigate the cases individually as we work to seek justice on behalf of the victims and their families. The detectives detailed to the FBI Violent Crimes Task Force investigate violent crimes citywide. You are definitely getting the attention, attention um, that, that hopefully these cases will benefit from, Beverly. I'm glad they're saying something, mm -hmm. but I think you'll find their presence in the docuseries and the fact that we remain ever vigilant uh, in terms of their progress or lack thereof will keep them involved. Mm -hmm. And I feel certain that we will find that it is one or more serial killers. Um, I don't think that we will ever um, have the police department acknowledge that there is a serial killer mm -hmm. until they have identified and arrested a serial killer. But the compelling evidence that the Murder Accountability Project has put forth um, leads me to believe there's more to be revealed. Number three, 
the West Mesa murders. The West Mesa murders are the killings of 11 women whose remains were found buried in 2009 on the West Mesa desert region of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Several suspects have been named, but none were arrested or charged. While the killings were initially believed to be the work of a serial killer, the involvement of a sex trafficking ring has since been suspected. Between 2001 and 2005, 11 women were buried by an unknown assailant in an Arroyo Bank on Albuquerque's West Mesa in an underdeveloped area within city limits. Satellite imagery taken between 2003 and 2005 showed tire marks and patches of disturbed soil in the area where the remains were recovered. By 2006, development had begun for new infrastructure, and the victim's burial site was disturbed and platted for residential development. Due to the 2008 housing bubble collapse, development on the west side halted before housing could be completed. This is all pertinent to the discovery of the first body just one year later. On February 2, 2009, Christine Ross was walking her dog around the West Mesa. Her dog picked up a bone that looked suspiciously human. Christine texted a picture to her sister, who was a nurse at the time. Her sister recommended that she contact the police. Over the next month, authorities located more remains and sent them to the lab for testing. At one point, authorities thought there were a total of 13 victims found, but the number was eventually narrowed down to 11 women and a fetus buried in the mass grave dug up in the West Mesa. The bodies discovered were women between the ages of 15 and 32. Most were Hispanic, and most were involved with drugs and sex work. All the women found went missing between 2003 to 2005, and according to satellite photos, the last victim was buried in 2005. No official suspects have ever been named in connection with the murders. The case is still open and has never properly been solved. It's the biggest homicide case in Albuquerque. 11 women found buried on the West Mesa, and today marks 13 years since the first woman was discovered. And that family's grief is still as fresh as ever. Our anchor Sasha Leninger spoke to the mother of one of those women, and this is a story you'll only see here on 7. With tears in her eyes and heartbreak still raw, Mary Gutierrez wants closure. It's hard every day. You, you think about this every day, it never goes away. Her daughter is Victoria Chavez. You see her photo right here on this poster. She was really a fun, outgoing girl. Yeah. She had dreams. Chavez is one of 11 women and an unborn baby found buried on the West Mesa in 2009. On February 2nd of that year, a woman walking her dog found a human bone. That bone belonged to Chavez, who remains the first discovery of many. I was at work and I told him, no, you know, I, I was in denial. I, you got the wrong, you know, you, it's wrong, you know, it's, you got the wrong person. Gutierrez, sitting alongside her grandson, listened as detectives and agents spoke about the city's largest crime scene. We still regularly receive leads on this investigation and we run every single one of them to ground. To date, more than 1,184 tips have been called in. Hundreds of people have been interviewed. Many persons of interest have been identified. For Gutierrez, the last 13 years have been gut-wrenching, but she's holding on to hope to one day have closure. Somebody out there knows something. Please come, come forward. Because I know you have a mother, you have sisters, you have a family. She, along with 10 other families, still looking for answers all these years later. Number four, the Long Island Killer. It was late in 2010 that four bodies were recovered from a desolate stretch of beach on the coast of Long Island. It wasn't until the next spring that law enforcement recovered six more bodies and went public with a statement announcing that the murders were all the work of one single killer. The so-called Long Island serial killer case remains unsolved and some have placed the blame solely on the Suffolk County Police Department. Reports and rumors of corruption have come up amid the department's failure to bring the killer to justice, with some suggesting that it went unsolved because higher-ups in the police department didn't want the truth to come to light. Why haven't there been any arrests after all these years? Well, Anthony, it's very difficult to identify a serial killer because they're not connected with their, victor, with their victims. But in this case, there was a police chief who took over the department from 2012 to 2015, who inexplicably cut out outside agencies and then engaged in a cover-up to cover his own misdeeds, and that certainly hindered the investigation. The Long Island serial killer, also referred to as the Giglo Beach Killer and Craigslist Reaper, is believed to have murdered between 10 and 16 women over a period of nearly 20 years and disposed their bodies in areas on the south shore of Long Island, New York. 
Most of the victims were sex workers who advertised on Craigslist. The victims' remains were found over a period of several months in 2010 and 2011 after the disappearance of Shannon Gilbert resulted in a police search of the area along the Ocean Parkway near the remote beach towns of Giglo and Oak Beach in Suffolk County. The remains of four victims, designated the Giglo Four, were found within a quarter mile of each other near Giglo Beach in December 2010. Six more sets of remains were found in March and April 2011 in Suffolk County and Nassau County. The first discovery of human remains was made by the site of Ocean Parkway in Oak Beach on December 11, 2010. The investigation was prompted by a search for Shannon Gilbert, a 24-year-old sex worker who had disappeared in the area in May of that year after fleeing from a client's home and making a 23-minute long emergency call to 911. State police. Yeah, there's somebody after me. I'm sorry? There's somebody after me. Where are you? There's somebody after me. Okay, where are you? I don't know. Are you driving right now? No, I'm inside the house. I'm sorry? I'm inside the house. What house? I don't know. Can you speak where I am? I'm sorry? It's where I am. No, I can't. What's your callback number you're calling from? Huh? What phone number are you calling from? I'm in Russell. Please. Are you in Suffolk County or Nassau County? Um, I'm in Long Island. Where on Long Island are you? Okay, No. 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 No, stop, no. Where in Long Island are you? In Suffolk County? Nassau County? Huh? Why are you calling me by my name? Why? County on the line? Stop. Stop it, please. Please stop. Please, can you shut the door? No, time to go. Please. 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 Go that way, please. Go, 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 That is the voice of Shannon Gilbert calling 911 on May 1st of 2010. She was calling from the gated community of Oak Beach on Long Island in New York. Shannon was a prostitute who visited a client in that neighborhood. That call for help did not save her. Shannon disappeared. The initial search of the area Shannon was calling from did not reveal what happened to Shannon or where she was but it did uncover something even more shocking a series of bodies and a potential serial killer 
and as more bodies were discovered, the search intensified and finally, 18 months later, Shannon's body was found. A month after her disappearance, the Suffolk County Police Department's Missing Persons Bureau asked Officer John Malia to search for Gilbert with his trained cadaver dog, a German Shepherd named Blue. Over the course of the summer in 2010, the officer unsuccessfully searched the gated beach community where Shannon Gilbert had last been seen. The officer made a new attempt at the search on December 11, 2010, staying close to the shoulder of the parkway. Despite thick vegetation and a light layer of snow, John's cadaver dog alerted to a scent, which the pair tracked to a skeleton and a descent grating burlap bag. The remains were later identified as Melissa Bartholomew's. Police discovered three additional bodies while searching the scene for further evidence. And the bodies of the four victims were Maureen Brainard, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. They were all found approximately 500 feet from one another. In March of 2011, the partial remains of Jessica Taylor were found along Ocean Parkway. Eight years earlier in 2003, Taylor's other partial remains had been discovered in Manorville, a town in Suffolk County. The next month, in April of 2011, police discovered three additional sets of remains, an unidentified female toddler, an unidentified adult, and Valerie Mack, whose partial remains, like those of Jessica Taylor's, had been found years earlier in Manorville in November of 2000. Two more bodies were found in Nassau County, an unidentified woman whose partial remains had previously been found on Fire Island in 1996, and another unidentified woman with a distinctive tattoo of peaches, who was later found to be the mother of the unidentified toddler found earlier in Suffolk County. The victim known as Peaches and her little girl are the only known black victims in the Long Island serial killer investigation. Peaches is officially known as Jane Doe number three, and she's been dead at least 25 years. A hiker found a woman's torso in this green Rubbermaid container on June 28, 1997, inside Hempstead Lake State Park. This peach's tattoo was observed above the victim's left breast, and a C-section scar revealed she had once given birth. In April 2011, Peach's extremities were discovered in the brush off Ocean Parkway in Jones Beach. DNA and gold jewelry tied Peaches to a toddler skeleton found 10 miles east on Ocean Parkway. Ten sets of remains east and west of Gilgo Beach were linked to the elusive Long Island serial killer known as Lisk. Peaches and her daughter are the only known black victims in the case. A key development didn't happen until May 2020. Today we are announcing that Jane Doe number six has been positively identified. Then Suffolk County Police Commissioner Geraldine Hart revealed victim Valerie Mack was finally identified after the FBI used Genetic Genealogy, a public DNA website, to find Mack's relatives. Hunters had found Mack's torso in the year 2000 in the woods of Manorville, and her extremities were discovered 11 years later 40 miles to the west off Ocean Parkway. These new discoveries revealed the killer's distinct style in separating and discarding body parts in several locations to throw authorities off track, possibly from the location where he lives. Not to mention that this murder doesn't discriminate between adults and children when it comes to his executions. On November 29, 2011, police announced that they believed one person to be responsible for all 10 murders and that the perpetrator is almost certainly from Long Island. We know that the Gilgo Four were killed, were all four killed by one killer, and that he didn't just drop the bodies off at once. And so investigators believe he is very familiar with Long Island. Um, and here's something really interesting. One of the investigators told me he had to have a cover story because he's going back, back and forth to the um, Ocean Park where, where he's leaving the bodies so that he may have posed as a private a trash collector or a hunter. Yeah. And he also probably was harmless looking, but he has a cruel streak because he called the little sister of one of the victims in 2009 and told her he had killed her sister. The single killer theory stems from common characteristics between the condition of the remains and forensic evidence relating to the bodies. In June of 2011, Suffolk County Police announced a $25,000 reward for information leading to an arrest in the Long Island murders. To this day, all the murders remain unsolved. What's it gonna take to get an answer here? What it's going to take is that Rodney Harrison, the police commissioner of Suffolk County, has got to break the blue wall and stop the nonsense with the police department's cover-up. It is a de definite, willful cover-up. As I said, the key players, such as the district attorney, have not even been brought into the investigation. The FBI has been brought in in a very thin, narrow way, and the sheriff's department is kind of like just addressing 
They're not investigating. They refuse to do it. You have to wonder why. Number five, the I-70 killer. The I-70 killer is an unidentified American serial killer who is known to have killed six store clerks in Indiana, Missouri, and Kansas in the spring of 1992. His nickname derives from the fact that several of the stores in which his victims work were located a few miles off of Interstate 70. His victims were usually young, petite, brunette women. Only one of the victims was a man, but it is believed that the killer may have expected a woman on shift due to the fact that the store had a feminine name. All the stores attacked were specialty stores and were usually only robbed of small amounts of cash. Despite the case being featured on Unsolved Mysteries in America's Most Wanted, the killer is yet to be identified. The killing spree began on April 8, 1992 with the murder of 26-year-old Payless store manager Robin Fuldauer in Indianapolis. She was alone in the store when she was shot, having been murdered sometime around 1.30 p.m. Her body was discovered in a storage room in the back of the store at around 3 p.m. Less than $100 had been stolen from the cash register. The next two murders occurred on April 11, 1992 at the LeBride Bridal Shop in Wichita, Kansas. The victims were 23-year-old Patricia Smith and a 32-year-old store owner Patricia Majors. As this was the only case involving multiple victims, investigators believe that the killer was under the impression that there was only one woman working at the store. The duo had stayed past the normal closing time of 6 p.m. to allow a male customer to pick up a piece of formal clothing for a suit. Sometime after 6, the two women mistakenly allowed the killer to enter the store, thinking he was the customer they were waiting for. After the women were murdered, the actual customer arrived to pick up his item and came face to face with the I-70 killer. The customer noticed that the killer had a gun and was asked to come to the back of the store. The customer refused, after which the killer told him to leave immediately. The customer was so frightened that he didn't report the incident until more than an hour had passed. He provided details for a composite sketch of the killer, describing him as a slender white man with reddish hair armed with an Uzi-style gun. On April 27th, the killer claimed his next victim. 40-year-old Michael McCown was killed in his mother Sylvia's ceramic store in Terre Haute, Indiana around 4 p.m. McCown's wallet and less than $50 were stolen from the store. No witnesses reported seeing the killer beforehand, and it is believed by investigators that the I-70 killer chose the store because of its name, Sylvia's Ceramics, believing he would run into a female employee. McCown was reported to have been wearing his hair in a ponytail when he was shot from behind while kneeling to stock shelves. On May 3, 1992, 24-year-old Nancy Kitts Miller was killed while working alone at Boot Village, a footwear shop in St. Charles, Missouri. She opened up the shop at noon and was found dead by 2.30 p.m. The final confirmed murder was on May 7, 1992 in Raytown, Missouri. The victim was 37-year-old Sarah Blessing, who was working in her gift shop. The murder occurred during the day, and the owner of the video store next door saw the killer enter the store, heard a gunshot, and then saw him leave. He discovered Sarah's body after checking to see what the loud noise next door was. A clerk at a nearby grocery store also saw the suspect as he was climbing a hill towards the I-70. Take a good look at this composite. It's of a suspect in a three-decade-old high-profile case that's gotten national attention. More specifically, this is who investigators believe is the I-70 serial killer. And these enhanced, these age-enhanced sketches that you see right here show what he could look like today. Here's what police say happened. Six store clerks along the interstate were killed in a murder spree that stretched over 29 days. Two in Indiana, two in Kansas, and two in Missouri. It was in the spring of 1992. Detectives tell me the scenario for all six murders was basically the same. The killer walked in, shot the clerk in the back of the head, and left. All in broad daylight, all using the same gun. On April 27, 1992, the I-70 serial killer claimed the life of 40-year-old Michael Mick McCown. McCown was working as a store clerk at his family's ceramic store. It was on South 3rd Street. Police say McCown was the I-70 killer's only male victim. Davis stays connected with McCown's family. They want this case solved, and so does he. When I see them, uh, especially when they get emotional, they still get emotional after 30 years. And um, that's something that affects you. In the last two years, Davis says he's witnessed firsthand this cold case warming back up. Heat brought on by all the law enforcement agencies investigating this case. He says, yes, they have a facial composite of the suspect and ballistics do link the deaths, but they need more. That's where advancements in technology come in. All agencies working this mystery have evidence that's been sent away for DNA testing. The results from that testing could very well match and finally reveal the killer's identity. In November 2021, 20 years after the murders, Terre Haute Police Department announced that the I-70 killer 
was a possible suspect in the 2001 murder of a liquor store clerk named Billy Brosman. On the evening of November 30, 2001, Brosman was working alone at the 7th and 70 liquor store in Terre Haute, Indiana. Security camera footage showed a white male suspect enter the store and pulled a gun on Brosman before robbing the cash register. The footage then showed the suspect lead Brosman to the back of the store and murdered him with a single shot to the back of the head, a similar execution style used in the previous murders discussed. Unlike the I-70 murders, security footage of Brosman's killer exists and police claim they have a person of interest in the case. Based on witness descriptions, investigators were able to produce two composite sketches of the killer and a physical description of the suspect. The I-70 killer was described as a white man in his 20s or 30s between 5'7 to 5'9, thin and having lazy eyelids, and sandy blonde or reddish hair back in 1992. In 2021, the St. Charles Police Department published age-progressed versions of the original composite sketch to show what the killer may look like today. If he is still alive, investigators believe the killer is between 52 and 70 years old. Police have not publicly come forward with any suspects' names, and the murders are now considered a cold case in true crime history. For three decades, one case has stumped law enforcement. Who is the I-70, I-35 killer? Investigators say challenges have been created due to the time past since the killings happened and a lack of technology available in the 1990s. As the search continues, a new person of interest has surfaced, the newly identified I-65 killer. Harry Edward Greenwell was accused of killing three women along the I-65 corridor in the 1980s, years before the I-70 killer's first murder. The composite sketch was similar. Um, in the way that he committed his crimes, he, he did target, the I-65 killer did target specifically women, um, and he did shoot them in the head with, with a handgun. So, you know, there's definitely those similarities. Detective Brad Rumsey with the Terre Haute Police Department says the task force is looking into potentially resubmitting the ballistics report from the gun used by the I-70 killer. As of right now, no potential suspects have actually been interviewed at any of the agencies involved, um, but that's not to say there's not something possibly in the works. On April 27, 1992, Michael Mick McCown was killed in Terre Haute. One piece of evidence from that crime scene was sent off for DNA testing in Florida. Results will then be compared between the agencies to ensure accuracy. It's believed uh, that that particular piece of evidence was more likely either touched or handled by the potential suspect and uh, our likelihood of DNA transfer onto that item. For the family of McCown and others, the search for justice continues.